Train journeys are always lovely. How beautiful it is to sit just beside the window and watch the beautiful scenes pass by, sip a hot cup of coffee or a tea. And that too, if this journey is accompanied by the best of your friends, what more can you ask for? Isn't it? That seems nice, right? So whenever we travel through the trains, whenever we travel through railways, it's always a nostalgia, it's always a feeling that we'd always love to cherish, right? So you must be thinking that why am I talking about railways? Am I going to take you people on some kind of journey? Are we going together on a trip? So if I say the answer is yes, I am sure that you'll be delighted, right? So, well, I am going to take you on a trip, but this is going to be a virtual trip where we are going to cruise through lots and lots of means of transport transportation yes so today we are going to recall a topic that we have been learning ever since our childhood you know ever since the classes that we have already cruised our kindergarten sections our sections of primaries and pre-primaries junior college so we have been already studying about the means of transportation but all we knew about this topic was that we have basic means of transportation like the airways the waterways and the roadways and also the railways and we did not get into the details of it or some facts regarding that isn't it so what different are we going to do today we are going to just get into this we are going to actually find out that how these lifelines of the national economy help us out in the real time so without wasting any further time let's get started with this amazing chapter this is a short one a sweet one let really amazing one okay so what are we going to study today let's have a quick insight into that so we are going to talk about the roadways the railways the airways and we are going to talk about the communication systems as well as the tourism part fine so i want you all i want all my avengers all my ignitions to assemble in the comment section to assemble in the comment box because this is the platform this is the virtual place where i get to connect to you people listen to your thoughts understand what you're feeling what you're saying so come on assemble everyone in the comment section so what are we going to talk about so when we talk about these kinds of pictures you know imme immediately we remember about the different means of transportation that we follow in our day-to-day -day life for example when i come to the studios to record the classes for you to take some really good mentee sessions for you definitely i use some of the other kinds of transportation now since the studios are definitely built on land the offices are built on land uh, definitely i'm not going to take uh, railways to the office because that would sound sound very weird but yeah i do take metros at times you know uh, the people living in the metropolitan cities they can very well relate if they are having a uh, suburban railway systems or the metro systems so metros are ag again a different kind of joy ride especially i i literally you know love delhi metro because it's a whole joy ride while traveling in the delhi metro you come across so many kinds of people doing so many kinds of things it's always enjoyable okay so and also it reduces much of our time much of our costly money the precious money so these are some kind of transportation systems that are helpful and useful in our day-to-day -day lives isn't it but moreover that we for smaller distances we generally prefer to use uh, we can say buses autos rickshaws isn't it or some other kinds of road transportations in fact if you talk about traveling from one city to another city if the distance is not much then also we at times prefer roadways nowadays we have seen advancements in the kind of road transports that are available to us for example earlier the buses used to be something of very downgraded quality but nowadays we as the like uh, as the market is now full of players like volvo mercedes you know so we get more com comfy buses we get more comfortable buses isn't it so these are the different kinds of things that have made our lives pretty much easier and apart from that when we talk about uh, the economy of the nation the economy of the country so these mediums of transportation have also added to that a lot right for example whenever we talk about transportation it's a kind of service isn't it so transportation is a kind of service so when you talk about transportation this is included in the service sector isn't it now apart from this if i talk about apart from this if i talk about that you must be thinking then how can a road transport contribute to a country's economy let's try breaking this down into simpler formats see for example i have taken an auto to the office so i'll pay the auto wala bhaiya say a certain amount maybe 100 rupees or 120 rupees now those 100 or 120 rupees are ultimately getting added to the economy of the country in direct or indirect way i am spending that amount that auto wala bhaiya is spending that amount in some other place so gradually that money is revolving around in the economy itself isn't it so gradually whoever works for it 
right so when we pay the person the person contributes it in many indirect forms so basically when you're talking about the different meaning uh, means of transportation in one or the other way in direct or indirect way they have always contributed towards a nation's economy a nation's robust infrastructure will always boast of a good transportation system and if if uh, and especially if i talk about if a city is having a very efficient a very very efficient public transportation system you'll also see that that particular city will have better chances of controlling or curbing the pollution around and the people will be able to save a lot more because when you talk about public transportation systems generally they're comparatively cheaper though they may not be at times very comfortable or they may not be up to the standards that we are expecting but still they're com com more convenient they are more uh, cheaper, they are more, uh, you can say that, uh, easily accessible. So these types of things, they always add and boost up to a country's infrastructure, okay? Now, let's try getting into an insight into different kinds of transportation. And on the first note, we have the roadways. Now, India, if you talk about, has one of the largest road networks in the world. That's an immense, you can say, immense good thing. Now, if you talk about the total road network, it uh, sums up to 854.7 lakh kilometers. Now, this particular road network includes both the urban roads as well as the rural roads. Now, if you talk about roadways had certain advantages. Now, this is a nice question. It can be asked uh, for three or five markers that what are the different advantages that the roadways has? Number one, the construction of roads is much uh, less costly when compared to the construction of railway lines. That's absolute true. When we are constructing the railway lines, that ne needs huge amount of capital investment. But when you're talking about road construction, that needs comparatively less amount of investment as compared to the laying down of the railway lines. Apart from that, when you talk about other advantages, roads can cover better geographical locations. For example, when you go to the hilly and the mountainous regions, especially the people who must have traveled into Himanshal uh, Belt, you know, so you might be very much familiar with this fact that roadways are the most accessible forms of transportation in the hilly areas and the mountainous regions because it's very difficult to lay a, a railway line at that very elevation, isn't it? The roadways are more convenient way of transportation. It can be your car, it can be your, you can say, auto, it can be your tempo traveler, it can be normal Volvo buses, any kind of transportation that works on road, right? So that are more uh, common form of transportation when it comes to the Himalayan regions or the hilly regions or any such geographical region that is very much inaccessible either by air transport or by water transport or by rail transport. So in such regions, roadways always have an edge over other means of transportation. Now, roadways can negotiate higher gradients. That means easily we can build the roads on higher slopes, on mountainous regions, on hilly areas, right? Road transport is comparatively economical. For example, I'm traveling a distance of 600, 700 kilometers, right? For example, uh, I'm uh, like there is, is a city A and there's a city B, right? And both are situated approximately 700 kilometers apart, okay? Now, definitely a faster means of transport will be the railways because rail, rail would take lesser time in comparison to the buses. But at the same point of time, if we compare the cost, we'll see that railways may be possible if you're traveling by a good class, say third AC, second AC, or first AC, you may have to pay more. On the contrary, if I'm traveling, I'm, uh, traveling by a Volvo, right? For example, let me take the example of Manali itself. Uh, if I travel to Manali, Manali is roughly 560, 570 kilometers from Delhi, okay? So if I take a bus, if I take a Volvo bus from Delhi to Manali, so it takes approximately 13 to 14 hours to reach Manali from Delhi. And the fare is round about 11 or 1200 rupees. That's all. That's pretty cheaper, right? If I opt for the airways, I'll have to pay somewhere near 6000, 6500. And if I'm booking it in urgent, I'll have to pay the dynamic pricing. That means I'll have to pay more costlier price for the same air ticket. Same way, we don't have any railways option till Manali. Uh, so I'm left with very, very less options. Okay, let's take one more example. Let's take the example of Shimla. Okay, for example, if I talk about Shimla, Shimla is roughly 400 kilometers from Delhi. For uh, traveling by train, I'll have to first travel till a, a region in uh, Punjab. I'm not remembering the exact place. That's Ambala, right? So, okay, so from Ambala or Kalka. Yeah, exactly. I got the word Kalka. So Kalka is a region again in the Punjab province. So basically when you're talking about Kalka, if I have to, first I'll have to take a train from Delhi to Kalka, which will, a good train will cost me around 700 or so. Okay. From Kalka again, I'll have to book a toy train, which will again, again cost me another six or 700. So what I'm paying is roughly, roughly 14 to 1500 for one person. 
on the contrary if i just take a volvo bus from uh, delhi to uh, straight away shimla i don't have to change anywhere in between plus the kind of fare that i have to pay is around about 900 or 1000 rupees so somewhat i'm saving on the total cost or the total amount okay or the total ticket you can say so comparatively at times the roadways the buses they seem to be more economical in nature now it provides door to door service right from the destination source to destination you will find it more easier for railways at times it happens that railway stations are built little bit far from the city and you have to take something to commute back to the city such the things happens in the case of airways as well because airports they need huge space so generally airports are generally not built right in the midst of the cities they are little bit built far away from the cities so it takes time to commute to the airports or the railway so called railway stations okay now road transportation it provides links between the railway transportations airs and the seaports that's a very nice point for example if i have to travel to ijai that's indira gandhi international airport delhi so definitely i can take metro right i can take metro or i can take a bus to there so there are buses that uh, fetch with that can fetch me to the airports so they are kind of link that joins seaports airways airports you know and the railway stations as well so road transports they definitely have a edge over lots of other means of transportation but they do have some kind of you can limitations as well when it comes to extremely huge distances then it becomes very very difficult to travel by roadways and especially if you're traveling across seas or across borders it's very difficult to travel by the roadways in that case you'll either require railways or either you'll require the airways right now let's talk about the different categories into which we divide the roads number 1 let's talk about this amazing project that is golden quadrilateral super highways now this is a particular project that is connecting the four top metropolitan cities of india namely delhi kolkata chennai and mumbai so we'll start from here delhi kolkata chennai and mumbai so you see there's a kind of quadrilateral being made right so that is why the project if you see it on the map of india this is somewhat you will be able to see right so we are starting with delhi then kolkata then chennai then mumbai so it is connecting all the four directions or the all the four big metropolitans so this is a very ambitious project of nhai that is national highways authority of india right so which aims at connecting the four different bigger metropolitan cities that is delhi kolkata chennai and mumbai you can remember it is very nicely so for example we had some great biryani and great uh, uh, food of chani chowk in delhi further then we moved to have some good rasogullas in kolkata after that we wanted to have some idli vada so we went to chennai and last we wanted to have some vada pav we came to mumbai so after eating biryani of delhi we went to ra eat rasogulla of kolkata then we came to chennai to eat idli vada and from there we went to maharashtra to have vada pav so this way this way you can remember all the four metropolitans that are being connected by the golden quadrilateral project now who manages this project this is being managed and run by nhai that is national highways authority of india now let's talk about the national highways now this is a very important one right because for sure you will be having questions from these topics and that to individually they can ask you what do you mean by the golden quadrilateral project or they can ask you what are the national highways and state highways so what are the national highways in very simple terms they are the network of roads that are laid and maintained by cpwd so first you need to know that which is the operating and maintenance authority that is cpwd cpwd stands for central public works department right so these are basically the roads that generally connect the state capitals isn't it like from one state capital to another state capital or from one state to another state you will be connected by these roads the these roads they you know they run throughout the country and it's not only that they will be connecting only two states they'll be connecting lots and lots of cities all together for example if i talk about the highway that starts from you know Uh, amritsar it passes through delhi then from delhi it passes through uh, kanpur from kanpur it goes to alabad that's pragraj at present then it goes to varanasi then it goes to kolkata so that's a huge road so that is nh right call as the national highways at times when you will be you have moved, you must have moved out with your families on a road trip right so you must have come across while you are traveling on a very good road you know with a good speed so you must have come across that milestone at the side of the road that reads out nh1 nh2 or certain amount of kilometers so what's our nh nh are the national highways right for example if we talk about we have one very historical one that is called as the grand trunk road or the sher shah suri mark all the nh1 that connects between delhi and amritsar so the portion of the nh1 between delhi and amritsar is also fondly known as the sher shah suri mark or or the grand trunk road or the gt road so this question is also very good if they can ask you that the shesha suri mark runs between dash and dash so you need to remember one word that is dm that is delhi and amritsar da that is delhi and 
Amritsar. Okay. Now let's talk about the state highways. What are state highways? So basically, they are the uh, roads that link the state capital with the different district headquarters. Now, a state will definitely have certain districts, and those districts are got uh, definitely are going to have their headquarters, right? The administrative areas. So the roads that connect the state capital with the different district headquarters of a state, such kind of roads are called as your state roads. Now, these types of roads are generally constructed and maintained by SPWD that is called as the State Public Works Department, right? So state roads, what are state roads in very simple terminology? State roads are the one that connect the state capitals with the district headquarters, okay? State capitals and district headquarters maintained by maintained by SPWD. Remember, they are passing through the state maintained by SPWD that is State Public Works Department, right? Now, moving on further, let's come to this. Let's come to the district roads now. These district roads, they connect the district headquarters with the other places of the districts, right? Suppose there is a district, it has an administrative center that is the headquarter of that district. So from there, the road will be built to connect the different parts of that particular district, okay? A smaller unit you can see in the state. So these types of roads are called as district roads and they are maintained by Zilla Parishad. Okay, they are maintained by Zilla Parishad. What are the other kinds of roads? We have rural roads, the ones that are present in the rural areas or the villages and they connect the villages with the towns, isn't it? And apart from that, if you see that under uh, like they are classified under such kind of roads. So these roads, they received special kind of uh, funds under the Pradhan Mantri Grameen Sadak Yojana. So that was an objective, that was a government initiative in which it was made sure that we have better roads, better quality of infrastructure that may link our villages to the nearby towns and cities so that it becomes very accessible for the villagers in case of any emergencies or say if you want to sell their produce in the nearby towns and nearby markets. So if they'll have better quality of roads, better infrastructure, it will get easier for them to connect and move to and fro. Isn't it? So these types of uh, roads, they receive great amount of, uh, you can say that importance under Pradhan Mantri Grameen Sarak Yochana. Now, this is a very important part of the chapter that is border roads. And this is a short, short question. So we have this organization that's kind of government undertaken, uh, established back in 1960, that is 1960, that is border roads organization. Now, what is the task of border roads organization? Okay, so border roads organization is responsible for strategic, for uh, construction and maintenance of roads in the strategic areas. Now here strategic area stands for especially the areas in which India has some international borders or that may have some importance with respect to India's internal security, isn't it? So in such areas, the roads are built, constructed and maintained by BRO, that is Border Roads Organization. If you talk about the Atal Tunnel, that is very much in news nowadays, isn't it? You must have seen the videos of Atal Tunnel being, you know, completely, you can say that it has been bombarding in the past few uh, days in the entire YouTube or the social media, especially when people are visiting Atal Tunnel during this time, during the time of during the time of winters, right? So it is all covered with snow. So you might have uh, seen the entire social media full of these Atal Tunnel figures or the pictures, right? So this Atal Tunnel has been built by this BRO, that is Border Roads Organization itself. Now, that's a great point, isn't it? Now, at times, we also classify the roads on the basis of the materials that have been used, right? So on the basis of that, we classify roads as metal roads and unmetal roads. When you talk about the metal roads, they are made out of cement, concrete and even bitumen of the coal, right? So these are all weather roads. That means even in the rainy seasons or the monsoon seasons, these roads are not going to break down, okay? And these will remain intact. So such kind of roads are called as metal roads. However, at times we find roads that are not built out of the cement or concrete or using the bitumen and all. These roads are generally made out of interlocking of the tiles or any other temporary method. So such type of roads are not very much useful, especially during the winter, especially during the rainy season, because when it rains heavily, these kinds of ra uh, roads are not able to sustain that pressure and they may break down or they may be potholes appearing in such kinds of roads, right? So these are the various ways in which we can classify the roads. Now, let's hop on to our express, that is the English Express or the Ignite Express. And it's time to go chuk chuk chuk. That means it's time to go into the railway sector. Yeah, let's talk about the railways. Railways are always fascinating, isn't it? So I, my personal favorite are railways. It doesn't matter how long the distance is. I always prefer to travel by railways because see, airways are definitely comfortable and faster means of transportation. But at times, airways may not give you that thrill that you can get in while sitting in a train. Isn't it? Because sitting in a train, that honking of the engine and that views, you know, that's altogether very mesmerizing all in all. 
and especially it's like you know if you are sitting just uh, near the window seat and having that cup of coffee to yourself you know and lost in your thoughts and just looking outside from that window you know and just imagining the beauty of the nature that just living those moments that is really precious that no other means of transportation can give you believe me that's why train journeys are love especially for me they are love if you also like the train journeys do drop in in the comment section okay now let's talk about the railway so railways are come you can say the very common mode of transportation okay for carrying huge amount of loads the bulky materials over longer and shorter distances we have seen that when people they get transferred from one city to another at times they uh, you know they carry all their articles or all their goods and just load them up into the train wagons and the train wagons get them transported to the other cities so such kind of parcels are transported by railways over long and short distances however despite being so important still railways they also face some kind of disadvantages let's let's get into that now construction of bridges across the rivers because railways the trains have to cross the rivers if they have to travel throughout the country now that's a costly affair isn't it so that needs wide beds for laying down the railway lines that's definitely uh, you know that's a uh, tedious task because first of all if the river has good amount of water it gets very difficult to construct a bridge over that river okay and apart from that bridge you need wider columns because you need to lay down the railway tracks isn't it apart from that if you talk about in the hilly areas especially in the peninsula regions if you talk about the ghat sections have you ever been to the ghat sections right so ghat sections you will see that there is a great gradient gradient here means a kind of slope you know so it uh, whenever you are visiting the ghat section ghat section let me clearly define it uh, i'm asking you to visit mumbai to goa section okay there you will find good amount of western ghats so the the route is absolutely beautiful it's real beautiful however i've just seen that in the videos i haven't uh, experienced the route myself but for sure if i get a chance in my life i'll definitely go and explore that route out but that ghat section is really beautiful if you want to enjoy that beauty between maharashtra and goa i'll suggest you to visit those areas and visit that particular route during the monsoon seasons because that is the time when most of the waterfalls the seasonal waterfalls are brimming with the water right so that is a very good time to uh, visit that particular section so when you uh, start that ghat section you can find its videos on the youtube as well so you can see how beautiful it is so what are ghats ghats are the hilly areas on the western and eastern flanks of india okay so what happens when this train starts you know climbing up those ghats there is a gradient good amount of gradient i mean there is a kind of elevation that the train has to climb so you'll see that there are double engines attached so that it gets a good amount of uh, pressure okay or it helps the train to move in the upward direction uh, to move in the forward direction or to climb up that gradient so you'll see that that it's again a very uh, difficult task to build uh, you know railway lines in such kind of hilly areas isn't it so the railway tracks are either laid through low hills or gaps or tunnels and this is one of the biggest feature of this entire section that you will find lots and lots of tunnels while you are traveling to the western ghats okay in eastern ghats part the elevation is not that much so you will experience more in the case of western ghats that they are very much continuous okay so they have to be passed through tunnels only you will find lots and lots of tunnels through which the train passes now the himalayan mountain ranges again they are very much unfavorable for the construction of railway lines because they are very very high very very high elevation and it's very difficult to construct railway lines in such areas right apart from that the population density in such himalayan belts are very very less so as a result you could we won't find much amount of profit while operating the services there now it's very difficult again to lay the railway lines on the sandy plains if you talk about right through the middle of the thar desert it's very difficult to lay down those railway lines and operate railways however there are few tra trains that run to the heart of that thar desert isn't it you can google them out you can see their videos on youtube as well so there are trains which travel right through the thar desert it looks beautiful but at the same time it's very difficult to face the scorching heat of the sun because when you are sitting on those trains there's lot a lot of dust that will get enter inside the train inside the coaches and it will be all you know dusty and you know dusty and down so that these are some of the biggest challenges that our railway faces over the period of time but still if we say okay so when you talk about the railways we generally have three types of gauges now what are these gauges let's try to understand them narrow gauge meter gauge narrow gauge meter gauge and broad gauge okay 
so basically gauge refers you must have seen the railway tracks let me explain it to you more practically you must have seen the railway tracks now there is some gap between those tracks isn't it so earlier what we used to have this gap was pretty much less okay even less than 1 meter it was less than 1 meter right so such kind of tracks what's commonly called as the narrow gauges okay such kind of tracks were normally called as the narrow gauges on in hindi we call used to call this as choti line okay so this choti line is nothing but the narrow gauges nowadays in toy trains and all you can find these kinds of tracks then we have tracks that have distance that are one meter distant apart so there one meter gap between these types of tracks a one meter sleeper is available so these are generally the meter gauges and then we have where it is more than one meter okay so these are generally the broad gauges that are now being used so in india the maximum line that current railway track line you know it has consisted of it is consisting of the broad gauges okay so basically when you're talking about the railways it has come pretty far and we are um, one among the largest rail networks in the world so that is something we can really be proud upon so railways will always be and always are an emotion no, no doubts about that but still it is useful in multiple ways though it has some disadvantages or some limitations now let's talk about the pipelines they are again a very good important part of a transportation now you must be think thinking sir what do we transport through pipelines can we transport humans through pipelines well that's not the case because we cannot transport humans through pipelines that that's altogether a different uh, imaginable situation right so that's altogether a complete imaginable situation we do not transport human beings through this but we do transport materials through it especially when you talk about iron ores and all isn't it so iron ores are converted into semi solid semi liquid formations okay so these iron ores are again then transported through the pipelines then we have gases natural gas that gets transported the lpg gas that gets transported so there are multiple water also gets transported oil also gets transported so there are multiple things multiple materials multiple goods that we are able to transport with the help of these pipelines okay now so pipeline network it uses the pipes usually that are laid underground and transport the fluids right now so what do we transport we use water crude oil petroleum products natural gases fertilizers okay so all these kinds of products are transported with the help of these pipelines so we can also transport the solids when they are converted into slurry so what is slurry i told you a semi solid semi liquid kind of substance right now let's talk about the major important pipelines now this is this is a great question can be asked in three marks okay so we have from oil field in upper assam to kanpur kanpur lies in uttar pradesh okay so this is one pipeline so we have three major pipelines at present so this is the first one we can talk about this so it is connected from upper assam to kanpur in up and it passes through guwahati barauni and alabad which is now prayagraj okay now it has certain branches so it's just like that imagine like this so it is this is assam we have started a pipeline okay that is passing through kanpur guwahati prayagraj okay and from there it has branches as well branches means it is subdivided okay so what are the branches from barauni to haldia via rajband then rajband to morigram and guwahati to siliguri so in the meanwhile these are the three major junctions when you're talking about kanpur guwahati barauni and prayagraj apart from that from these major junctions there are subdivisions of these pipelines or their pipelines are further subdivided through various channels and which are those places through which they pass then from barauni to haldia via rajband and then from rajband they go to morigram and from guwahati they go to siliguri that means from guwahati we have one more branch if this is guwahati from this guwahati this will go to siliguri so there are branches okay from assam it is connecting three major areas from that also we have subdivisions or sub branches so this is how the pipelines are getting divided apart from that we have salaya salaya lies in gujarat to jalandhar in punjab and this pipeline passes from virangam mathura delhi and sonipat now it again has branches that connect koyali that lies near vadodara gujarat chakshu and other places so this is how the pipeline network works and then we have the first 1700 kilometers that is hvj hazira vijaypur jagdishpur now this is the most important one bachcho this is the most important one and has very much probability of being asked they can ask you what is the length of the hvj pipeline that is 1700 kilometers okay so this is the first 1700 kilometers hvj pipeline hazira vijaypur jagdishpur okay that passes cross country it's a gas pipeline 
this links Mumbai High and Basin fields with different fertilizers, power and industrial complexes on the western areas and in the northern India. So what is this pipeline serving? So this is pipeline is basically serving the commercial objective. As we can see here, this 1700 kilometers pipeline, it is connecting two major gas fields with the different industrial parts situated in western and northern part of the country. Overall, if you talk about India's gas pipeline infrastructure has expanded from 1700 kilometers to 18,500 kilometers. Now, that's a big boost to the gas infrastructure from just being 1700 kilometers to 18,500 kilometers. It's a huge leap. So, we can say that our pipeline network is growing by leaps and bounds. And that is something really positive about the boost with respect to a country's infrastructure. Now, Let's talk about something really cool. Let me make some waterways here. However, I'm very bad at drawing, you know. Very means very, very bad at drawing. But this is just for your reference so that we can talk about the waterways. Waterways, they are the cheapest means of transport. Very suitable, very environment friendly, non-polluting. And they're also good for carrying heavy and bulky loads. However, however, there's a small limitation or exception to this, especially when you're talking about carrying bulk of roads, cargo loads across the different nations. Then at times, the cargo ships, especially the ones that are mechanized, working on, you know, diesels and other kinds of uh, fuel systems, they at times can lead to pollution in the uh, ocean water. And especially if you talk about the oil tankers, if the oil spills from those tankers, then it uh, generally forms a thick oil covering on the surface of the ocean water and then it becomes very difficult for the aquatic animals to breathe in oxygen. So that can be some kind of limitations or exceptions. Apart from that, waterways are comparatively more environment friendly options. Okay, so it's a fuel efficient and environment friendly mode of transportation. So when you talk about India has an inland navigation waterways of 14,500 kilometers in length. Now what does inland mean? Inland here means basically the type of waterways that are connected between the different rivers. Right, so we do operate the different water transportation between the rivers and apart from rivers we operate it in the oceans and uh, the seas. Right, so if you talk about the inland navigation India has about 14,500 kilometers of length. Out of these, only 5,685 kilometers are navigable by mechanized vessels. What do you mean by mechanized vessels? The vessels here which stands for the ships or the containers that are working on mechanical basis, for example, using some kind of machinery or some kind of fuel systems. So out of the entire length of 14,500, only this much length is available where we can use such kind of ships. For other uh, part of the length, for other part of the distance, we have to use the manual labor or the manual kind of boats. Right, so this is how the waterways works. So we have some national waterways. Now this is very important, okay, because they can ask you a uh, write a note on the national waterways. So we have three different national waterways: national waterway number one, national waterway number two, and national waterway number three. Okay, the national waterway number is very easy: Ganga River between Allahabad and Haldia. This Allahabad is now Prayagraj. Let us please uh, mention this. Okay, Haldia is in Bengal. It's very simple. I'll tell you it's very easy to, very, very, very easy to remember. See how. Now, this is Prayagraj. If you're from Prayagraj, if you'll take a straight road, you'll come to Varanasi. From Varanasi, you'll come to Kolkata. If you take a route by river, then also you'll follow somewhat the same route only. Okay, so when you talk about the National Waterway number 1, it's over the Ganga River and it crosses, it starts from Prayagraj and goes to Haldia, covering a distance of 1620 kilometers. National Waterway number 2 lies in the Brahmaputra River and that is between Sadia and Dhubri and it covers 891 kilometers. The third number out of waterway, the third uh, National Waterway is uh, the West Coast Canal that lies in Kerala. Okay, starting from Kottapuram Kollam. Udyog Mandalam and Champakar canals that covers a total length of 205 kilometers, right? So these are the three important waterways. The first one being in uh, Ganga River, the second one being on the Brahmaputra River, and third one being in the West Coast Canal, right? So that generally can, uh, that generally includes the Kottapuram uh, Kola, the Kottapuram Kollam Canal, Udyog Mandalam and the Champakara canals, right? So these are the three major waterways of India, which which contribute to the huge amount of trade as well as transportation mediums with respect to the water transports right now lots of lots of theories isn't it let me ask you a question let me ask you a question are you ready are you ready just tell me that yeah so sure. let me ask you a question i'll ask you a lot many more in the upcoming mentees or any kind of live sessions we are having but here for the moment let me ask you one simple question 
the simple question is just tell me the root of national waterway number one do you have the comment sections to yourself come and go out and just uh, pour in your answers let me know what you have learned so just tell me what's the what's the root covered between national waterway number one okay the comment section is all yours come on show me your talent i'm waiting for you show me your talent i'm waiting for you come on i'm waiting for you i'm waiting for you show me your talent yeah absolutely good absolutely good i'm absolutely waiting for you that's nice that's nice that's absolutely nice okay very good very nice fine so i can see that lots and lots of people have given me the answers now that's super cool people are telling me that lies on ganga river between between what pragraj and haldia that's nice 16 20 kilometers covered now let's talk about the national waterway number one national waterway number one that lies across godavari and krishna rivers along with the kakanada Kakinada Puducherry stretch of canals. Okay, so it includes three different kinds of water bodies. First, we have the Godavari, the Krishna rivers, and then we have the Kakinada Puducherry canal. So total length covered is 1,078 kilometers. Now, when you talk about the National Waterway Number no. Five, so basically the stretches of the river Bahamani, and along with Bahamani River, it incorporates Matai River, right? And also it includes some canals of Mahanadi. Or the delta areas of Mahanadi and Bahamani rivers and the East Coast Canal, right? That comprises the total length of 588 kilometers. Inland waterways in India are also present. Inland, again, I said that the waterways or the areas generally inside the rivers from uh, traveling, traversing over the shorter distances that are used as a medium of transportation, right? So these inland waterways are present in Mandavi, Zwari, Kamburjwa, Sundarbans. Barak and also the backwaters of Kerala, right? So you must have listened about the backwaters of Kerala. They are very much famous. Why they are famous? Because they serve as a great place for tourism. Now these backwaters are generally, you can say, kind of canal system or kind of you can say a water body that has separated out from the seas or the ocean part. And uh, across these backwaters of Kerala, you can uh, see a good number of houseboats being lined up. So over the period of time, they have become very popular among the tourists. People go there for tourism purposes to explore the backwaters of Kerala. So these are again some very good examples of the inland waterways that exist in our country. So we are literally blessed with the kind of transportation systems we are having. And that thanks to the natural kind of availability of the different harbors, of the different amount of you know rivers. Thanks to all those things that it is possible because of that only. Isn't it? Now, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the major seaports. Now, this is an interesting part. This is a very interesting part of the chapter. See, the point is, the chapter is easier to understand. I've tried to, uh, you know, uh, made it, make it very crisp for you. Now, this is very, very important part of the chapter. I'll tell you why. Number one, with respect to the one mark question and second, with respect to the map-based questions. Because you'll see maximum map-based questions are asked out of the seaports. Okay, so we'll try to get into each one of them. So I've just sorted out in one liner form so that it gets much easier for you to remember each and every seaports out there. Right, so India's trade with our foreign countries is carried from these seaports. So there are two major and 200 notified non-major airports or the intermediate airports. So we have a great network of, air, not the airports, pardon. So Bachon, that is the seaports. We have been talking about lots and lots of air here. Okay, so our trade with the foreign countries are conducted with the help of these seaports. So we have two major seaports and 200 non-notified, okay, you can say that, semi-important seaports existing in the country through which the trade is carried out. Now, if you talk about Kandala in the Kutch region, Kutch is basically the Gujarat part. So Kandala in the Kutch region, it was the first port that was developed after independence. Okay, it is also called as the Deen Dayal port. Now, this is very important. This is really very important that which port in India is also called as the Deen Dayal port. So that is the Kandla port. Mumbai is the biggest port with a spacious natural and good harbour. So Mumbai has an added advantage of having a naturally sheltered harbour. I mean the place where generally usually the ships are parked. Okay, very, very simple. So we need places to hold those ships, you know, because we can't park the ship in a garage. That's because ships are huge. They need a good amount of space to be, you know, to stand or to, you can say, park somewhere. So these are the natural harbours where we can park the ships. Very simple. Isn't it? So Mumbai has a very big and natural harbour. It's the biggest port. Now Marma Gao part, uh, port in Goa is the premier iron ore exporting port of India. So when you talk about the exports of iron ore from India, that is majorly done from the Marma Gao port that's situated in Goa. Apart from that, we have the Mangalore port. Mangalore is located in Karnataka. So you have this Mangalore port in Karnataka. Again, this is very important with respect to the exports of iron ore. Then we have Kochi port that is in located in the extreme southwestern part. Okay. And basically, it is located at the entrance of a lagoon. 
So Kochi port again is very very important. So Kochi port is located in the southwestern part. Now, apart from that, what do we have? We have Tuti Korean port. Tuti Korean port is located in extreme southeast. So if the our question is that which is the extreme southwestern port, you can give the example of Kochi. Okay. If the question is which is the extreme south West port, what is the example? What is the answer? That is Kochi. If the question is which is the extreme southeast port, what is the example? That is Tuti Gorin. Fine. So Tuti Gorin, again, it's a very important one. That's in Tamil Nadu again. So Chennai is again one of the oldest artificial ports of India. So that's again a very good question. If someone asks you that which is the oldest artificial ports of India, you can give the answer that is Chennai. Now, this question is a very much repeated. It's a PYQ. Let me write this down. It's a PYQ because it has been asked several times in the examination with that which is the deepest landlocked port in India. That is landlocked port, right? So that is your Vizag or Vishakha Patnam. Okay. Now, Paradeep in Odisha is again very much famous for the exports of iron ore. Okay. So Paradeep port in Odisha again very much famous for the export of iron ore. Kolkata. Kolkata has river, river Hooghly, isn't it? So we do have a port in Kolkata also that is very much important with respect to trade as well as navigations. So Kolkata again is an inland riverine port. That means a port that is constructed in a river. Then we have Haldia port. Now Haldia port was developed as an alternative to reduce the port, to reduce the pressure on Kolkata port, right? So this question is again asked many times in the examination that which port, which port was constructed to reduce the pressure on the Kolkata port. So the answer is Haldia port. Okay, very simple. Now, let's move forward, further. So finally, we have the airways. However, let me draw an airplane for you. And hope I draw it very good. That is actually not possible. I'm trying my best. I hope this is not a veil. Okay. Nice. So I have tried my best to draw an airplane, but I don't know how good it has been drawn. So I've tried my best. I said my best because I always miss out on the drawing classes. So that's why I don't have just horrible. I have pathetic drawing. Okay. So sorry for that. But still I was trying to just relate it so that you can understand. Yeah, these are the airways. Okay. So airways like the fastest and the most comfortable and prestigious means of transport. It's like a show off. You flaunt a lot. You know, people have seen putting on the Insta stories, the air tickets. Doesn't matter the air ticket is just from Delhi to Chandigarh, but they are flaunting it. You know, I'm traveling by such and such airways. You know, and doesn't matter, you know, but it's a kind of flaunt. You have to, you know, look after everything. What should be your airport look? What kind of bag you should carry? How cool are you looking? So these are, I think, most of the people that do out before heading out to the airport. So it's just not limited to the means of transportation. Nowadays, it has also become a kind of luxury sense or a fashion statement to travel by airways. And, and nowadays, if I talk about people, they post stories of, especially if they're getting a window seat in the airplane, you know, stories of the clouds and with all that motivational quote. You might have also come across such kind of stories on your Insta. Uh, gram reels or instagram stories or any any other social media platform right but however if you talk about saving the time then airways is the answer because airways easily able to traverse over longer distances suppose if you want to travel from india to europe definitely we are not going to take a ship because it will take lots of time so the convenient way of traveling to europe is to travel by airways or an airplane isn't it right so when we talk about this airplanes or air transport has made access much easier to the higher mountainous regions or the desert areas. We do find at times Air Force, Indian Air Force doing some kind of rescue operations in extreme difficult terrains and extreme difficult geographical situations, right? And that is just possible because of the airways, isn't it? They have some choppers, some specialized aircrafts that make them very accessible to land on the such kind of situations and rescue people out of there, isn't it? So airways have this very much advantage when it comes to some very, very difficult terrains and it is possible to reach those terrains by airways, not for a very longer period of time, but at least for a sufficient amount of time till your purpose is served. Right now, the air transport was again nationalized back in 1953. 
Air India provides domestic international air services. However, Air India is no more government undertaking. It has come back to Tata Group again, right? So Tata Group, so Air India is again privatized once again. So it is now again back to the Tata Group. So let's hope for the best. However, with the period of time, Air India hasn't proved out to be very profitable, right? And with respect to the comfort also, parents uh, like passengers have always been complaining about the same. So hopefully we wish some better good and nice days for Air India. But that time is again going to tell. So when we talk about nationalization, that means it has become government undertaking, right? So that was nationalized back in 1953. But we do have lots and lots of private players in the airways because airways again are a medium, faster medium, prestigious medium, and you can say moreover, a luxurious medium of traveling from one place to another, right? Apart from that also we say, then we also see that at times airways are also very much helpful in providing some very necessary facilities. For example, the Pawan Hans Helicopters Limited, they provide services to ONGC, that is Oil and Natural Gas Corporation people. Okay, Oil and ONGC, that is Oil and Natural Gas uh, Corporation people in their offshore operations. For example, uh, when the people have to go for mining activities or other excavation activities, uh, like off the coast, then they are helped out by this Pawan Hans Helicopters Limited, right? So, but when we talk about, and especially if we talk about uh, the areas like extreme areas of the northeastern parts of the country, or if I say religious areas, for example, Mata Vaishno Devi situated in Jammu and Kashmir, right? So, when you go to Mata Vaishno Devi, so they have a service, they provide uh, helicopter services to the people who are not able to, like, you know, uh, trek up to the hill, that uh, Trikota Parvat, where that entire shrine is situated. So, that's a trek of approximately 14 kilometers. It gets very difficult for the old age people or the people who are not very much healthy and fine and fit. So for them to trek up to that kilometers of distance, that too on a hillside, it gets difficult for them. So in such cases, they do have helicopter services. So that are rented out on pretty much cheaper basis. Let me tell you the price even as far as I remember. It is somewhat uh, 27 or 2800 at times for both ways, like coming and going, right? So they are comparatively cheaper services. So we do have air services in some strategic locations that are being offered at extremely discounted price. But in the meanwhile, or in a normal sense, air was a, airways have a bigger limitation that they are comparatively they are comparatively costlier, right? However, they are comfortable means of transport and a faster ones as well, right? Now, let's come to some real good part that is called as communication. Now, communication is really important, isn't it? Because see, what is communication? It's very simple. It's a medium through which I'm able to make you guys understand that what I want to say. And also, if I if we talk about communication medium between us, that is our comment section. As I always say, that's a virtual connect between us. So whatever you people are thinking about anything, isn't it? So you let me know that in the comment sections. I read those comments. I get to understand. Okay, this is a problem, or these are your uh, uh, these are your like you know concerns, and let's find out a way to solve out that, isn't it? So such kind of things are very much visible. So in the same way, communication is a simple system where we try to express ourselves and also we try to understand what others are saying. Now this communication can be done in written form, in verbal form, in recorded form. Like right now, I am recording something for you. I am telling out something to you. So what I am doing is I am communicating out to a larger mass isn't it so all those students who are watching me out on YouTube they are understanding something from me they are learning something from me and so what I'm doing is I'm communicating I'm just expressing out my knowledge I'm sharing out my knowledge with you so this is a kind of communication that I'm doing at present isn't it so we have multiple ways we have multiple ways to communicate with each other isn't it now let's talk about few ways of communication so the major means of communication in India, we have the mass media like TV, radio, press, the movies, isn't it? And apart from that, if you talk about the postal cards, the letters that have become a long forgotten story nowadays, otherwise earlier the postcards and the letters used to be, the mails used to be amazing facilities, isn't it, of communication. Nowadays we do have the Indian postal network, that's one of the largest in the world, or you can say the largest in the world. Right, so Indian Postal Network, that is the largest in the world, right? So it handles the parses as well as the personal little communication. So basically, when we used to have English classes back in a school times, I'm talking about 10 years back. So we did have this uh, postcard writing and advanced writing skills back in class 9th and 10th. So we used to write and we had in fact written a postcard as far as I remember being in class 4th or 5 we had some environmental kind of campaign and we were asked to write the postcard addressing to the PM of the country. However, we never know if there was those postcards they ever reached the PM's office. Okay, because they were huge in number. I don't know what happened after that. But sure, we were made to write some kind of postcards on environmental concerns. Okay. 
Now, postcards were like a yellow card, okay, on which you can write some good uh, information or something exciting and post to one of your friends or relatives or anyone who you want to send, right? So, but the limitation was there on those postcards. Then we had Telegram as well. However, I haven't written a Telegram except in my English classes. Okay, so there I used to write a Telegram. Telegram was a kind of communication medium where you where you were charged for every single word. So you have to be very much limited in your word limit. Your vocab has to be damn good. So your journal limit used to be 25 to 30 words. So however, those uh, means of you know communication are very much outdated nowadays. So today we have you know Instagram. Today we have WhatsApp. Today we have Facebook. Today we have uh, Snapchat. Today we have Twitter. Today we have uh, what not? I mean X Y Z. There's a great number of social media applications. It has become pretty much easier to communicate with people across the globe isn't it I may like for example I also at, at, at times I connect with people on video calls my friends on uh, video calls like who are situated who are based out of India at present so it, it, it has become like a you know the entire uh, world you can say has shrunk to a little global village so that that is just possible with the advanced means of communication however when you talk about the Indian postal network it today also the different kinds of courier services everything are met out by these kinds of postal networks only right so first class mail that are very much important, they are airlifted or generally transported by air, isn't it, that have to reach at priority. Second class mails that includes the book packets, the registered newspapers, the periodicals. So they are generally carried by the land transportation or the water transportation. However, water transportation nowadays are not very much being used, right? So land transportation is again there. So recently I just came across one of these uh, very famous food delivery out uh, this, uh, this one application. Okay. I hope you must also use that application. I'm not naming it uh, here right now, but this application has started a very amazing point that you can order from nearby cities. I mean the legends of the cities. So suppose if I'm sitting in Delhi, I can order something from, uh, I can order Rasogulla from Kolkata. And I was really amazed to see that they're in delivering me the Rasogulla the very next day, right uh, somewhere in the afternoon. And that was really amazing for me because I cannot imagine, you know, sitting in Delhi, I can buy Rasogulla from Kolkata. That's really fascinating, isn't it? But now it has been possible just because of the better amount of transportation, the better infrastructure and the better communication facilities, right? Now, moving on further, let's talk more about communications. So India has one of the largest telecom networks in Asia. That's a great point. And also we have uh, the cheapest uh, we can say that we have very cheap mobile facilities. If you talk about the data packs and the that is costing in India, that is way much cheaper compared to lots and lots of other countries, isn't it? So we can say that that is comparatively cheaper here. Like the STD calling, that is very much in ex uh, less in existence nowadays. The STD facilities all over India are possible by the development of space technology with communication technology. Now, how do you, like for example, let me just uh, pick up my cell phone. Okay. So this is a smartphone, right? Let's let's try to understand it very practically. So this is a smartphone. What does smart what does a smartphone can do? It can wake me up at 4:30 or 5 a.m. in the morning. It can uh, play me some videos, some songs if I'm getting bored. It can play me some games. I can play some games in it. I can manage my work in it. I can plan my day in it. I have a calendar in it. I can manage my meetings on it. I can uh, write on it. I can actually you know I can do lots and lots of things from one single device. That is smartphone. And I can also connect with my friends over calls, isn't it? How is this all things possible? How can I call a person? How can I connect with a person through any kind of social media website just using my smartphone to a person who is sitting thousands of miles away from me? That is possible because of the satellite communication, isn't it? So we have certain communication satellites that receive those signals, transmit them to another places. So when we have integrated this communication and space technologies, it has turned out to be a boost. Nowadays, we all use Google Maps to track the different kinds of distances, isn't it? For example, if I want to go to my friend's house, I know his address, but what is the way to reach that particular point? I don't know that way. What I'm going to do is I'm simply put, going to put that address in the Google Maps and maps are going to guide me. How is that possible? Because of the satellite tracking. Isn't it? So world has come a long way. We don't realize it, but yeah, it has happened. Isn't it? Now, when you talk about mass communication, so generally the mass communication that provides entertainment and it also creates awareness among the people, right? Through various programs like radio, television, magazines, newspapers. So when we come across these communications, they are circulated to a wider audience, isn't it? And this wider, or wider audience, when reads these kinds of newspapers, books, magazines, they get to know about the different kinds of things going all around. 
Apart from that, if we talk about the India All India Radio Channel, Akashvani. However, we have different kinds of radio channels at present. We have 93.5 Red FM, 92.7 Big FM, and lots more, isn't it? Earlier, we used to have this All India Radio. Still, it exists, the Akashvani program. So it broadcasts many matters of national and international importance in regional and local languages as well. Then we have Doordarshan, the national TV television channel. That's one of the largest terrestrial networks that we can come across in the world. In fact, not only in India. Apart from that, India publishes a good number of newspapers and we have about, that are about in 100 languages and dialects. So we have lots and lots of local and regional newspapers apart from the English or just Hindi. We have Gujarati, we have Marathi, we have Punjabi, we have Bengali. So we have huge number of languages and in all those languages the media is published. Now that gives us an added advantage of diversity that we have in our country. Now when you talk about trading, Again, a very important aspect and probably the last aspect of this chapter after which we'll be just winding up with the topic, right? It was a short and crisp one, isn't it? I told you right in the beginning of the chapter that this is going to be a short and crisp video. Okay, so when you're talking about the exchange of goods among people, states and countries, this call trade very simple. If I sell this pen out to you, okay, and take some money from you, what I'm doing is trading. So we're exchanging goods or services between two peoples, two states, two cities or two countries even. That is called as trade. When done between the two countries, it is called as international trade, right? In very simple terms. So when we talk about the international trade, it is considered as the economic indicator of a country. If you are having good trade with the fellow nations, if you are importing less and exporting more definitely it's a kind of boost to our economy isn't it so import and exports are very important components so balance of a trade between these is basically what we do is when you have to calculate the balance of the trade what we do is balance of trade what we do is we calculate the difference between the exports and imports export minus import so very simple if we have more of export and less of import isn't it so if we have more of import and less of export, then it is called as favorable balance of trade. Now what happens here? Exports are greater than imports. right? So when your exports are greater than imports, then it is called as a favorable balance of trade. Because in such a case, what is going to happen? A country is going to prosper. Because suppose if I sell, if I sell products to a country X worth rupees, thousand, okay? Suppose if I sell some products to a country X worth rupees, thousand, and I purchase products from that country X worth rupees only 100. So definitely I'm in profit because I'm paying less and they are paying me more. So I'm selling them more, but I'm purchasing them very less from them. Isn't it? So we can say I'm having a 900 profit here because I'm selling it for 1000 rupees, 1000 rupees products, right? But I'm purchasing only 100 rupees products. So generally I'm making additionally 900 rupees, isn't it? So my balance of trade is pretty favorable. So when I'm having more of exports and less of imports, we see that that is a good strong economy in that case. Now, but if the value of imports, if the value of imports is greater than exports, then this is called as the unfavorable balance of trade. In such cases, any economy is liable to have some kind of deficits or you can say debts because when we are having more of imports, that means we are very much dependent on lots and lots of things for with on other countries, right? So we need to be self-reliant, we need to be self-dependent. So a self-dependent economy, a good reliant economy will always have good parameter of exports being larger than imports, right? Now, international trade, so the commodi commodities that are exported from India to other countries include the gems, the jewelries, the chemicals and the related products as well as the agricultural products. And what do we import? What are the co commodities or products we import to India? That is petroleum and crude oil products, the gems and jewelry, some kind of gems and jewelry, some chemicals, some base metals, some electronic items, some machineries and some agricultural products, right? So we also export a lot of products and apart from that we also import a lot of products isn't it so we can see that we are importing a good number of products when we are comparing with the exports right so here in case of india in some cases we have favorable balance but in some cases we do have unfavorable balances as well now when you talk about tourism everyone loves tourism isn't it i also love to you know roam a lot i also love to explore a lot so i'm a one person who loves to travel who loves to trek who loves to explore cultures, who loves to explore food and lots and lots of things, right? So tourism nowadays, it's a great industry. It's a, it has a great potential. Especially India is blessed with multiple tourist places. If you talk about 15 million people are directly engaged in the tourism industry. 
Apart from that, what does tourism do? It promotes national integration. How does it promote national integration? Very simple. When peoples of different culture, they get mingled with the tourists. They teach tourists their culture. People from different parts of the world, different parts of the country, they come to know about the culture. They feel oneness with the people. In, in, and in result, this enhances the national unity and the integrity of the country. Apart from that, it provides support to the local handicrafts. Basically, whenever you go to visit a tourist place, we always love to keep some souvenirs from the place, right? So that, that is a memory that we want to cherish, that we went to Shimla or Manali and from there we brought something XYZ, isn't it? So these are the memoirs that we always love to keep with ourselves, isn't it? Now, apart from that, it helps with the development of international understanding about Indian culture. Especially when foreigner tourists, they visit our places, they love to visit India. You know, you can find many testimonials from the different people from different countries. So, India is one of the hotspot destinations that they always love to travel to. Right? So, foreign tourists, they visit India for heritage tourism, visiting the heritage places, for uh, environmental purposes, for adventure activities and also for medical tourism. Medical tourism is a term where a particular person is coming to a country or going to a country for medical treatments, right? So such kind of tourism is also very much prevalent in the country. However, this tourism has overall impacted in a positive way with respect to our economy and especially in employment generation, right? Okay, so it was a short and quick ride. I told you that we'll be hopping up into an express and we'll be, you know, uh, cruising through this chapter in a most crisp and amazing manner and uh, coming across the different kinds of transportation. It's an easy and one, but a very important chapter. Okay, so I want you to revise all the NCRTs. I mean, I want you to solve all the NCRT questions. You can pour in those answers in the comment section as well. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section if you like this video. Okay, so point is, uh, there's a lot to learn from this video entirely. Okay, very, very simple. So lots and lots of uh, things we have covered in points as the board demands, as the boards ask. And uh, my only point to you is, Keep studying, keep learning because bits by bits we are going to make it huge, you know. We all know that. We all have that confidence. In fact, I have that confidence instilled in you. I have already seen that when I was having that minty quiz with you. I'll be coming up with few more such kind of amazing and, you know, interesting things. There are lots more surprises on the way. But for the moment, this was the chapter, a small, sweet and quick chapter. So I want you to revise the scene from the NCRTs. Solve out the NCRT question answers because they are very, very important. And I'm going to meet you soon in the next video. Till then, stay happy, stay healthy and stay smiling. And stay tuned with PW. Bye-bye.